Okay. So, so last time, let me make a short summary of what we have done last time. Um, so basically, we were studying fermions, uh, free gas of fermions, and clearly the the first thing, interesting thing about fermions is what happens at zero zero temperature, and what we have seen is something that you you probably know already, is that even at zero temperature, let me close the door. So at t equals zero, what happens is that the occupation number n of q, where q is the wave number, as a function of uh, uh, um, yeah, we will actually Q. So, how many particles are in the state uh, uh, um, epsilon Q? Um, so, depending on the energy. So, then uh, T equals zero, basically, this is a, a theta function, kind of, a, well, not a theta function, but it's zero uh, above a certain value of the energy. Which is the Fermi energy. And is, uh, uh, so is one uh, below. Okay. Uh, well, this, uh, this gas, uh, it's a highly degenerate gas. And uh, uh, so basically, the interesting point here is that uh, there is a finite value of the pressure that we derived last time, uh, which is the Fermi pressure, and it is equal to 2 divided by 5 m density epsilon m. Uh, another remarkable point that we need to, uh, uh, I would like to remind you, is that there is a relation between density and chemical potential which is uh, analytic in this case, but it's simple, this is for t equal zero, uh, which was the following. So, okay, so g, if I want to introduce some degeneracy, because it's not very important, but in case I want to have some degeneracy, yeah, the degeneracy factor, um, then I have one third, uh, well, if you want, I can put here six directly, and here I have, uh, uh, well, what is the Fermi momentum cubed, which is 2 m mu divided by h bar squared uh, to the power of 3 half. And this is clearly a relation between mu and n. The larger the value of n, the larger the value of mu, which is also positive. So what happens is that uh, at t equals 0, mu is a finite number, it is positive. And therefore, the fugacity, uh, which was this quantity here, uh, in the limit in which t is going to zero, uh, well, this diverges, right? The fugacity goes uh, to infinity. Mm -hmm. uh, because I have a t that's going to zero and the mu is a finite value, so I have uh, the fugacity diverges. And of course, this is now the, the limit uh, in which uh, quantum mechanics uh, plays a major role. So, this is the degenerate Fermi gas for which we have a degeneracy pressure and so on and so forth, and all the, uh, the consequences of this, like for instance, the fact that if you have a gas of electrons at t equals zero, uh, they, they actually, uh, they actually uh, make a pressure, uh, exert a pressure that is, is Fermi pressure that, for instance, is responsible for the stability of uh, a white world, for instance. But there are many, many applications. Uh, now, in the opposite side, the classical limit, uh, let's start with Cancellino. What about the Cancellino? Uh, Uh -huh. 
So the fact is that uh, the region, well, the, the, the case in which uh, you really have a quantum, quantum effects that are very strong. Okay. Uh, so these are, those, these are the situations, small temperature of T1T, of which quantum mechanics is playing a major role. On the other hand, the classical limit is the limit in which the fugacity uh, is um, approaching zero. So this is the classical limit as opposite to this limit, which is, the, let's say, uh, the regime of quantum statistics. That is different in the case of bosons. In the case of bosons, the classical limit is still z going to zero, whereas the quantum limit is z approaching one, for which we have uh, the Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, this is the classical limit uh, in which the fugacity is approaching zero. Now, of course, one thing that maybe I didn't mention before is that uh, when you have uh, the occupation number, uh, which is uh, exponential of uh, beta epsilon nu, epsilon q, sorry, here you have z minus one. Now here, for the case of bosons, uh, for fermions, I have one, a one a plus, whereas for the case of bosons, I would have a minus. So you see that when uh, um, this quantity approaches zero, then this diverges. And therefore, uh, this basically equal to um, uh, this quantity here. Now, I can neglect the one, this limit, and therefore I have uh, the occupation number is beta epsilon q times z, which is basically just the uh, Maxwell Boltzmann. Okay. In which basically what I see from the Fermi Dirac or from the Bose Einstein is just the exponential tail. Okay. So this will be the Fermi Dirac at finite temperature. In this limit, the classical limit, what I see is just the tail, the exponential tail. Okay. Good. So what we were trying to do last time is to uh, see what happens. At uh, uh, t small, not zero, but small. So still in a regime where quantum mechanics play the role, and we want to see which is the basically to expand around uh, z infinity, because in this way we can, for instance, uh, uh, compute something which is uh, useful. Something, for instance, like the heat capacity or the entropy, and we will see that. Uh, uh, the scaling of these two quantities with respect to, uh, as a function of t is a little bit different with, res with respect to the case of bosons. And uh, um, so I think that we, at some point, uh, managed to write this equation. So we started from the f3 half of z, and we wrote this quantity, let me see if... Uh, uh, with everything there, yeah. So I have uh, uh, 4 divided by 3 square root of 5 nu to the power of 3 r2, where nu is the log of the fugacity. And uh, then I, I have this integral minus infinity plus infinity of, uh, so here I have the et, then I have et and et plus one squared, I would say, yeah. And uh, I can, uh, so here I had the one plus t divided by nu to the power of three half, that I can expand and write this as one plus uh, three half, uh, three half t divided by nu plus um, three, divided by 8, t squared divided by nu squared plus other terms that we will neglect, okay? This function was basically just 1 plus t divided by nu to the power of 3 r. 
okay? That we decided to expand. Uh, why? Why? Because uh, new is approaching to uh, is, uh, is uh, large and uh, in the in this limit that we are uh, computing. Um, so let me see. Okay, so the, the leading term is one we have computed already at leading order. We get that log of z is equal to tf divided by t uh, that we see last time. And of course, this is correct because uh, uh, one can also find it in the following way, considering that z is equal to uh, mu exponential of mu, mu data, therefore the log of fugacity is mu divided by kbt, and uh, at leading order, uh, uh, well, in the limit in which t is equal to zero, this quantity here uh, <coughs> is, is basically ef, okay, divided by kbt, and we can define this quantity as a temperature, Fermi temperature. Okay? So this was a leading order. Okay, so then let me shortly discuss uh, the next leading order, which will be this one, and this is zero. So if I have, uh, so next leading, I would have the integral of dt minus infinity to plus infinity of, apart uh, from some constant, is t uh, time exponential of t and x exponential of t plus one squared. Now, you can convince yourself that this is a, uh, um, it's an old, uh, old function and this is zero, the integral. Is odd. Uh, Why? Well, this is a uh, odd, whereas this is even. Now, if you if you do it, so, so you have uh, e to the minus e e to the minus e plus one. Then you multiply by e to the power of uh, this square, of course. Uh, let me see what was the trick. Uh, yeah, I multiply by e to two t and e to two t. Here I get uh, d to t, and in the denominator I get again d t plus 1 squared. And because I can put inside this, I have e to the power of t times this is 1, and then I have e to the power of t. So it's the same. So then basically this guy contributes 0 to this expansion. Okay, so now we have to compute the next to next. Though this is a language, a technical language that maybe in this context is a little bit weird <laughs> to talk about the so next meeting goal because it's not a kind of perturbative series, but anyway. Um, so anyway, the, the next term which contributes is the one in which I have uh, uh, this uh, 4 divided by 3 square root of 5 u 3 half. Then I have uh, uh, 3, 8 divided by mu, mu squared. I'm looking at this one. And I have this integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dt, uh, t squared divided by uh, what? Uh, d, dt, dt plus 1. Uh, I think that this is the next. Okay. Now, uh, uh, so now you can a little bit rearrange this uh, uh, this quantity here and make uh, uh, cosinus hyperbolic uh, cos h hyperbolic cosine. Uh, the trick is uh, oh so here there is a square sorry it is missing. Um, come si faceva questo? Well, the trick is that we, yeah, you, you put this uh, uh, inside, 
this uh, can be written as uh, uh, D key is squared, and here I have uh, e to the minus t, which is e to the minus uh, uh, t half squared. Then I have uh, t t plus one squared. Now uh, I can put inside this, uh, and then th this will become an exponential of uh, uh, e to the minus t half plus exponential of uh, uh, e to the t half, which is a, a hyperbolic cosine uh, times two, and this is squared. Therefore, this is uh, the integral is a uh, integral of minus infinity to plus infinity of t squared uh, dt, and here should have uh, four cos sinus hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic sinus of uh, t half squared. Okay. Vediamo se l'ho messo giusto, t squared diviso 4 t half. Ok, so then you change variable, you can uh, introduce y is equal to t divided by 2, dy is equal to t, uh, dt divided by uh, 2, and therefore here this integral will be uh, instead of uh, uh, t. I introduce uh, uh, y, so I will get a um, factor of 4 outside and a factor of uh, uh, 8. Okay, should be 8 divided by 4. And uh, then I have the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of, uh, so dy, y squared divided by cos squared of y. Okay? That should be. Uh, okay, so let me remove something here. So apparently I have done this, uh, uh, this integral uh, uh, in uh, <laughs> So just by chance, in an example of a mathematical method of physics, so you, you can do this uh, easily with the methods of uh, um, uh, residual theorem, and it's, it turns out that this is pi squared divided by 6. Um, yeah, so then what, what is left, what is left, um, is uh, so I have uh, 3 divided by 8 new, new squared, then I have this 8 divided by 4, it's in here, and, and then I have a 5 squared divided by 6. Uh, and therefore, this is uh, the end is equal to pi squared divided by uh, a eight new squared eight new squared. Okay. Vediamo se giusto è p squared sì perché quello là se mangio con quello sì direi di sì. Okay. So coming back now to our expansion of F3, F3 half of, uh, of the Fugacity. So the F3 half of Z is equal to, there was a 4 divided by 3 square root of 5. Then there was this log of 3 half, which was the leading term, the one that we derived last time, Z. Then I have uh, this pi squared divided by 8, pi squared divided by 8. Here you have a new squared, uh, which is the log squared, but in front of this, I had a new to the power of 3 alpha. Okay, so okay, maybe I write again, I write again the, the starting point. The starting point was the following. F3 half was uh, a 4 
divided by 3 square root of 5 mu to the power of 3 alpha. And uh, yeah, and then there was uh, this integral dt minus infinity plus infinity 1 plus t divided by mu to the power of 3 alpha. And here you have uh, uh, exponential of t and dt plus 1 squared. This was the starting point, okay? Uh, so therefore, when I expand, I have uh, the, the leading term, apart from some constant, is mu to the power of 3 alpha, which is this log. Then uh, we just derived this term, but since I have a mu to the power of 3 alpha, and here I have a mu squared, I get a factor of uh, square root of log of z as a, as a second term. Yeah, which is uh, uh, here. No. Okay. Plus other terms that I will not uh, compute anymore. Okay. Let me check if everything is consistent. Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. Now this quantity here. So this f3 of z is equal also to n lambda cubed because this was one of the equation uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that we derived from, 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 from the Fermi systems. So therefore, from here, I can uh, uh, basically write the log of 3 half of z in terms of all the other terms. Uh, so let me see how to do it. So log of 3 alpha of z is equal to uh, this 3 uh, pi divided by 4 and lambda cubed. Then I have a minus 5 squared divided by 8. And here I have the, log, the square root of log of z. <coughs> so let me see if this is uh, correct. Okay. Now I can use uh, what I found in the previous uh, expansion. And in the previous uh, uh, the previous uh, term of the expansion, we found that the log of z was the ratio between tf and t. Okay, so uh, now I can introduce uh, this quantity here and let me see how to do it uh, in, a, in a proper way. So actually, this one, if you look at the equation of last time, actually it's just tf divided by, well, it can be written or can be read also from this, is actually tf divided by t to the power of 3 alpha, you well, see from here. And uh, so therefore, this guy here should be uh, tf divided by t to the power of uh, Alpha, which is just this guy here. Then I have a minus pi squared divided by 8. And I have a, a log of z to the power of minus 1 alpha, which is a tf divided by t to minus 1 alpha. Okay. So let me go here. So here I have the log 3 alpha of z, which is equal. So now let me collect tf divided by t to the power of 3 half. Tf divided by t to the power of 3 half. And here I have 1 minus 5 squared divided by 8. And here I have a t divided by tf squared. T divided by T F squared. 
that should be correct now. Okay. Uh, let me check if this is correct. Indeed, so this should be, uh, yeah, so, so this is uh, um, thanks to minus three alpha and it goes back. Now it's time to expand this root, this uh, square root. So well, actually, to uh, uh, make uh, to compute the log of z, I have uh, uh, tf to t, uh, which is the same power, and here I have one minus pi squared divided by eight, and here I have a t, sorry, t tf. To t. Is a square, and then here I have a power of two thirds. Okay, two thirds. Uh, okay, now let me use the fact that t is small. Okay, so the, the ratio between t and tf. tf is a, is a finite number and is determined by the ratio between the, the Fermi energy and kb. Okay, so it's a finite number. Whereas t is small in our expansion. Therefore, I can actually write this as tf divided by t, which is the divergent point if you want. And here I, I have a, a one minus pi squared. Here I have a two third here, which becomes 12. And here I have t divided by tf squared. And that's it, I think. Almost done. Now remember that the, the, the Z is the fugacity, so the way with the log actually it is mu divided by theta, therefore mu uh, divided by theta, so I will have a KB uh, T if I want to collect to, to find mu. KBT, then I have TF divided by T and 1 plus minus pi squared 12 T TF squared. So then this goes away and KBT TF is by definition the Fermi energy. So this is now equal to the Fermi energy 1 minus pi squared divided by 12. Yeah. Okay, now this is the relation at finite temperature, finite but small temperature, between the chemical potential, the temperature, and the Fermi energy. Okay, so mu is equal to EF 1 minus pi squared divided by 12 PTF squared. Okay, this is the relation that I wanted to find, which is, uh, 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 as I said, a relation between uh, a Fermi energy, chemical potential, and temperature. Of course, at equal zero, mu and EF are the same uh, by definition. And then I have this correction, which is this quadratic correction that we we'll use in a moment to, to see which is the modification on the equation of state for uh, uh, such an expansion. But let me do first a plot of uh, where, I, where I put mu as a function of t. And I can make a comparison between the classical gas and the two, the two quantum gas that we are considering, namely the Fermi gas and the Bose-Einstein Bose gas. Now, in the case of Bose-Einstein, uh, the chemical potential is actually zero below a certain value of T, which is the critical temperature. And then becomes negative. Okay, so this for both was Einstein. And if you want, this is the critical temperature for the Bose Einstein condensation. Uh, in the case now of uh, uh, the Fermi gas instead, uh, I have it for t equal 0 mu is finite, and I will go here somewhere. And let me try to do the plot 
uncomfortable way. Okay, maybe it's a little bit exaggerated. Okay, so this is for Fermi and the outcome. When the chemical potential uh, becomes negative, and this is actually the classical limit, and then becomes positive when t is small and uh, uh, this number here, which is the Fermi energy, when t would be equal to zero, so this is actually the yeah. And the point at which uh, uh, you have the change of the sign is basically provided by, uh, is close to t equal to tf. It's not exactly tf because I have a pi squared by my class here, but it's close to tf. So basically, the tf provides. Uh, if you want a, a way to, uh, uh, the, to, so the typical temperature below which you start to see some important effects on quantum mechanics in statistics. And some, somewhere in the middle, there is the, uh, the Boltzmann gas, the, uh, the Maxwell Boltzmann, that uh, in principle I can also uh, plot uh, at uh, small temperature, uh, sorry. Um, uh, beyond this point, but actually it's not so meaningful. And uh, this case, uh, so this is Maxwell Boltzmann. Let me remind you what was the Maxwell Boltzmann chemical potential. The Maxwell Boltzmann chemical potential was provided by this relation, mu that was a, a kV uh, T log of n lambda cubed. And uh, we said also that uh, this uh, uh, quantity is correct uh, when n lambda cubed is mo much more than 1, which is the classical limit, uh, and at most when this, this quantity is equal to 1. So uh, this quantity equal to 1, I should, uh, I should stop using a Maxwell Boltzmann, okay? And here this is equal. Um, yeah. Okay, so these are basically the, if you want the, uh, the this is the comparison between the chemical potentials in this, this different uh, gas. Okay, so now next uh, next topic uh, or next uh, challenge is to find a relation. Uh, well, the next. Uh, uh, so, so the next correction to the pressure is due to the final temperature. So pressure at final and small temperature. And the starting point uh, is basically this equation here, lambda Q P divided by kBT is equal to, this was the F pi alpha of the capacity, which uh, in terms of an integral, which is the same as in the case of the Bose gas, was at A divided by 3 square root of pi, and here you have a dx, 0 plus infinity, x to the power of 4, then I have x squared, here I have z to the minus 1, and this is a plus, one, plus 1. Uh, now, basically the thing is that it follows the same step that we use for expanding uh, uh, F3 alpha. So at some point, one introduces the log of uh, the fugacity, which is equal to mu. And uh, um, I have to do at some point. Uh, Okay, when you do this, I can do it uh, immediately. Uh, so then it is just minus mu plus one, as in the case of the of the uh, of the previous f three alpha. Then uh, you introduce a variable x squared, which is equal to y. You change variable, and at the end you get. Uh, Something like this. So it's a 4, uh, 4, 3 divided by pi, integral from 0 to plus infinity of dy 
uh, y real put, and here I have a new, sorry, y minus new plus y. Uh, yeah. Whereas in the previous case, instead of having y to the power of 3 alpha, I guess I had y to the power of 1 alpha. Let me check. Yeah, indeed. And uh, well, okay, also the, 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 the numerical coefficient of this integral is different. Now you proceed as in the, in the other case, you do an integral by parts. And the, the quantity which is integrated goes to zero. And uh, at the end, you're left with an expression. So I'm not doing the calculation because just, they are just the same. So it's better to go on and think and discuss something which is more interesting. So, but if you do the calculation following really the same procedure as before, uh, I just want to remark you which are the main steps. Uh, then we get uh, 8 divided by 15, that's square root of 5. Uh, new, now this time to the power of 5 half. Then that we get the integral from minus infinity plus infinity of the t of 1 minus t divided by nu, this time to the power of 5 half. And then you get exponential of t, dt plus 1 squared. So basically, the structure is just the same as before, but for this different numerical factor and the fact that you have here 5 half instead of 3 half. I am here, here. So you basically proceed in the, in the very same, uh, you follow the very same procedure. So uh, now you write this as 1 plus t divided by nu uh, 5 half. And uh, plus the next term will be uh, uh, 15 divided by 8 t squared divided by mu squared plus other terms. So as before, the first term uh, is the usual integral, is e t, e t plus 1 squared, which is 1. The next one is 0. This contributes 0 for the same reason as before. They are the same, whereas this guy here provides again the same integral which is t squared e exponential of uh, exponential of t e t plus one uh, squared which was the pi squared divided by six okay so you basically get really just the same as before so let me write uh, which is the final uh, expression for f uh, f of five half of z now, these are 8 uh, divided by 15 square root of 5, which is this factor here. Then you have a log of uh, 5 half of z, uh, which comes from this guy. Uh, 8 divided of 15 logarithm of yeah. Then you have 1, which is the leading term, plus. So if you do the calculation, you get uh, 5 divided by 8, 5 squared, and then you have a log for z to the minus 2, plus other terms. Okay. Yeah, if you, if you want, I mean, apart from the numerical factors, basically it's just the structure here. You have a log of 5 half that is outside, and here you have the log of z to the minus 2, basically, okay? So all the thing is to compute to what, which are the numerical factors uh, multiplying this log, okay? <clears throat> so now what you do here is to use the previous expression for the log. Of that. So we derived before, uh, so you use now 
the fact that the log of the velocity was uh, Pf divided by t, 1 minus pi squared 12, and here we have ttf, sorry, t divided by tf uh, squared, and that's it. Okay, so now take this and put it here. Okay. Now this, of course, is long and boring, but uh, I want just to uh, so, so let me call asterisk this one and these two asterisks. So put asterisks into two asterisks. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Now this f phi half pi was actually p lambda cubed divided by uh, kbt, and now this quantity. Okay, so since I know that the first term should be the one that I already found, okay, so the Fermi pressure at t equals zero. Let me just. Uh, uh, I do the following. I just take care of the corrections, okay? Because anyway, I know that the first time will be the one that I already know. So uh, let me just uh, uh, let's say single out which are the main dependence uh, here from the temperature. So this is P, uh, and then I have a temperature KT, KB T to the power of. Uh, um, um, to five out. Okay. And then okay, I have some other constant. And this quantity is proportional to what I have there, which is the log of five half. And I can put this. So you have Tf divided by T to the power of five half. And then I have a one minus pi squared twelve T. Tf squared to the power of pi and half, which is this term here, okay? Cinque dodici, vediamo se giusto, si cinque ventiquattresimi, okay? Then I have this correction, so which is one plus pi pi squared divided by eight. Uh, and then I have the log of z to the minus 2, which is this quantity to the minus 2. Okay, so if I, I think I, have, I need some space. No, uh, so the agenda one. Okay, so sorry. So this, uh, this was the by by squared, and this was the log of minus 2. Plus other steps. That is a minus two. Yeah, so I have to introduce uh, this log z minus two in here by using this guy here. Uh, that will be a t f t and uh, so p t f t one minus pi squared twelve uh, t here squared everything is to the power of minus two. Okay, I have to write it back again, otherwise you can't see anything. I'm sorry. So let me write it back again here. So this five. Uh, um, so let me start from here. Okay, so this p to the and k d t five alpha. Proportional to Tf T, here I have a 5 half. So let me, uh, if you allow me, since T and Tf is a small number, I can put this 5 half in front of this and get a 5 divided by 24. And so let me just do this for a moment. So this is 1 minus, uh, I think this was a pi squared. Uh, so then, pi squared uh, 
5 divided by 24 p p f squared. Let me check if it is correct. Tf diviso t1 524 esimi, ok. Then we have one plus this one, we got here 5 by squared divided by 8. Um, and then I have a t tf squared, t divided by tf squared. And then I have a 1 minus pi squared divided by 12 t tf squared, which again, using the fact that this is a small quantity. Okay, so let, let me do it, otherwise, really, I don't understand. Well, then we have a t divided by tf squared, and this is the minus 2. And I think it's close, actually. Let me check if I have all the terms. Same. Yeah. Okay. Now it's clear that when you do the exam, see. Posso fare una domanda? Non ho capito. Cioè, nel rapporto tra le due temperature, mette sempre TFT e. No, no, no. Questi cani sono. Non è TFT. Cioè, a volte è T diviso TF, a volte è TF diviso T. Ah, ok, okay. Va bene. So, if you want to uh, look at in a, in a, let's say, reasonable way, uh, in front of all this expression, there is the divergent part, because the, this is divergent because T is small. Okay, whereas inside here you have uh, uh, terms that vanishes, that all, all of this term actually will be uh, zero when T is equal to zero, and then we'll just get the, the leading term. Okay, so these are all. Correction which goes as TTF to the power of 2. Okay, there are small numbers, whereas the divergent part is single out of sign. Uh, chiaro? Sì. So, the, so the divergent part is this one. Now you just need to reshuffle a bit this. Uh, these terms, it's, it's, it's boring, it's long, so, I mean, I don't think, I mean, if you want to try to do it, of course, it's, it's, it's good, but uh, I nevertheless, I will not ask you to do this calculation in the exam, because it would take uh, too much time. Uh, what is important is important to remind uh, which is the result. So here you have um, 1 plus this time pi squared divided by um, uh, 6. Because I can put this minus 2 here and this becomes plus 1 6 and t t f squared. Fatemi vedere se tutto corretto. Quindi la parte singolare sta lì, poi 1 più 5 nel tipo 3, si di pi greco, oh, bene, 1, 5 pi greco, tali, t diviso tf, 1 più pi greco, sesti, t diviso tf. Ok. Good. So now, as you can imagine, I can uh, work out uh, this expression that will contain a term, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, plus a correction which goes as t divided by tf squared. Okay? And you stop here. You neglect all the other terms. Now, from, so how many contributions do you have to, with the same power ttf? Well, you have uh, one, uh, well, you have all the combinations. Okay, so you have this times this, uh, this times this, and so on and so forth. Okay, so but if you stop uh, at the second order uh, in T, TF, you finally get that this correction is actually 1 plus, and if you work out the numbers, it's 5 pi squared divided by 12 T, TF, sorry, T. Yeah, squared. Okay, 
So this is the correction. It must be a quadratic correction. The only thing is to compute the number that is, uh, uh, that, uh, is in front of this quadratic correction. Okay. So basically, at the end, you can write that the pressure is equal uh, to the term, which is the, the, the t equal zero term, which we know already it was uh, 2 5 NEF times 1 plus. So this one corresponds to the t equal zero case. And then you have this correction. So if you have 5 divided by 12, 5 squared TTF squared. Okay, so this is the correction, the pressure provided by a finite but small temperature. Okay, small temperature. So what is important to remind to remember is that you have a quadratic correction. Okay? It's not important that you remember this coefficient or that you rederive by yourself the x sum, for instance, this coefficient because it's long and boring, it's just algebra. Okay, it's important to remind that this is a quadratic correction. Which is written in terms of power of TTF squared. Okay. Um, of course, you can also compute which is the uh, uh, correction to UN, which is the energy per particle, which was uh, at equal zero was three half per energy. Then you have one plus the same number. Okay. Which is 5 by squared divided by 12 again, and T, T, F squared. Why is it like that? Because uh, we remember that PD is equal to future U. Also, in the, in the case of a Fermi gas, uh, regardless of the value of the temperature. So, from this, you can get uh, uh, divided by N, you get the P divided by the density is equal to two-thirds uh, u divided by n. Therefore, u divided by n is just three-half p divided by n. Okay, so this is the correction, uh, to, uh, the temperature correction will be the same. Um, good. Now, okay, this expression are named summer field expansion. Or some of the series. Then, of course, you can extend just by taking more terms in the ratio t divided by u. Okay, we stopped at the second term, so the quadratic term, which was t squared divided by u squared. You can go on, and you can go, you can get the, all the other correction, of course. Uh, okay. Now, the thing that is interesting to notice. Uh, uh, about this expression, uh, first thing is the following. Now we have derived that p uh, scales as a constant plus a quadratic correction, okay, times another constant, okay. Now you might remember that uh, p. Uh, well, if I do the derivative of P with respect to temperature uh, at fixed, uh, let me see, chemical potential, should be, uh, this is equal to the ratio between S and volume. Okay, but this is the entropy per volume. Entropy divided by volume. Okay, so you see from here that uh, since the pressure is quadratic, the derivative will be linear, and therefore S will go to zero as T equals zero linearly. Okay, so again, we see that uh, the third principle of thermodynamics is fulfilled. 
So at t equals zero, I have zero entropy. And this is the third principle of thermodynamics. Okay. Uh, notice that even if, uh, uh, so to some extent, uh, this result, the fact that the entropy is zero, t equals zero, somehow is very intuitive in the case uh, of the Bose of the Bose gas because basically all of the state, all, all of the particles are in the same uh, state, which is the one with q equals zero. Here is a little bit different because actually. I cannot populate a single Q equals zero state, but I must populate all the states up to the Fermi energy. Uh, so they are not in the same state, actually. Nevertheless, the entropy is still uh, approaching zero when T is equal to zero. Okay, so this is a remarkable fact. Uh, that the Fermi gas at T equals zero, anyway, even if uh, the particles are not in the same state, uh, in any case, they have zero entropy. So this is the first thing that we, uh, let's say, as a byproduct of the summer of the expansion, uh, which is by itself interesting. Uh, of course, one could be interested also in computing uh, really the relation between pressure and temperature. But the most remarkable probably is the uh, heat capacity uh, uh, per particle, uh, which is just the uh, derivative with respect to temperature of u divided by n. Now this is done at fixed volume, the heat capacity at fixed volume. And by considering the expression that we wrote before for the energy per particle, so let me write it back again. Uh, this was a constant. Now let me write the numbers because I need the numbers actually. So we have three R. So we have, we have, then we have 1 plus 5 pi squared divided by 12 and t, t f, uh, squared. Now, if I do the derivative with respect to temperature of this quantity, uh, what do I get? I get that C D divided by n is equal to 3 of Pf, then I have a 5 pi squared divided by 12, then I have a 2, and then I have a t uh, divided by Tf um, squared. Okay, first, first, so I have 3 and 2, I have 2, I have 2, I have 2, I have 2, now, EF is KBT, uh, KBTF. Uh, so I think I have a pi squared divided by 2. Then I have a KBTF, uh, uh, EF. Then I have a T divided by TF squared. This concept, sorry, it's not TF, but it's T divided by TF squared. Yeah. Therefore, I have that CB divided by, let me put this KB here, which is the standard way uh, in order to make a comparison uh, with the classical gas. Uh, this now is a pi squared divided by 2 and times T divided by T F. Okay, I think it's correct. This okay, good. Now, as you see, the heat capacity is going to zero as T is going to zero linearly. It's contrary to the case in which you have, for instance, uh, for bosons, uh, um, was a three half, no? A CV equals to zero as T equals zero in the power of three half. Okay, as we derived last time. And for uh, well, for massless bosons, 
for massless bosons, it was a T cubed. Okay, so that allows you, but maybe this you have done in solid state physics, you know, which is the main contribution to the heat capacity if you have a metal, if you have a iron, for instance, you no, know, because you have a contribution from phonons and you have a contribution from, from electrons, and of course, uh, at equal zero, this would be the dominant term you know, for small temperature. This is the fact that the heat capacity of the electrons and solids. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so, so you have done also, how, do, how, how did you get actually this, uh, uh, this heat capacity without the summer for expansion? So, 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 have you done a alternative? Oddio, così non mi ricordo. Ok, sì, va bene. Sicuramente non con questa espansione. Ok, va bene. Oh, well, indeed, maybe, maybe the, uh, I don't know if this is this one, but uh, there is another way uh, to uh, infer which would be the behavior of the heat capacity at small temperature, which is the following. One can do uh, uh, the same, uh, one can use the, uh, the, this argument. So basically, uh, if we plot the NQ as a function of epsilon Q, now at t equals zero, this is what I get. Okay, this is the curve at t equals zero. When t is finite but small, what happens is that uh, I am, uh, I start to see an exponential tail, you know, I'm smoothing out, I'm smoothing out this curve, this curve. And uh, uh, since you, uh, the occupation number is this quantity here, is a beta uh, epsilon q uh, times the velocity, uh, z minus one plus one. Um, okay, let me write this in a better way. So actually it's minus mu divided by beta. Uh, times beta, sorry. Now, the region in which uh, you basically start to deplete uh, these levels close to EF and populate some levels above TF. Okay, this is what happens at finite temperature. So, this is fine temperature larger than zero. So, Basically, you remove uh, some of the particles below the Fermi surface and you put them above the Fermi surface uh, uh, by uh, exploiting uh, basically the, this exponential tail. And how large is this region is provided basically by the ratio between Kb uh, T, so the, the temperature, and, um, and Kb Tf, if you want. Okay. So this region here is, uh, in terms of energy, corresponds uh, really to KBT, okay? So the larger the temperature, the larger will be this, uh, this uh, exponential tail, if you want. The, so the region in which you start to uh, deplete uh, the Fermi surface below, the states below the Fermi surface, the Fermi surface and, and populate the, the states above uh, the Fermi surface. So one can actually infer that uh, what you see when you when you uh, uh, when you increase the temperature from zero to a finite but small value is that a fraction uh, of particles, uh, which is the ratio between KBT and K and KBTF, so a fraction KBT divided by KBTF of the N particles will have an energy of the order of KBT for each particle. Okay, so that means uh, that uh, uh, basically if you do the derivative uh, with respect to temperature of u, well, of un, if 
final volume, this will be the derivative with respect to temperature of what? Uh, well, basically of this number here. So you will have a T divided by Tf and which is just the number of particles that are moved from below the Fermi surface and, and above the Fermi surface. So, you know, uh, the particle that you remove uh, and you put uh, above the surface, from the surface is the ratio between T, T, F times M, which is the energy of those particles, is a KVT. Okay? And so you see from here, that uh, now, if you try to estimate uh, the heat capacity uh, uh, of a particle, you indeed have a quadratic uh, behavior of the energy density, of the energy of a particle, sorry. And so if you do the derivative, you get a t squared, and you do the derivative, and you get the power of t, and uh, it's a t divided by t. Okay. So you can infer that the scaling must be uh, T divided by Tf uh, just by following this argument. I don't know if this is the way you, you have done it in solid state. I don't know. Vi, vi suona familiare questo argomento? Sì, l'abbiamo fatto così, da quel che mi ricordo. Ok. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, the other way. So I repeat it, so anyway, you know it. When you increase the temperature, you start to populate some states above the Fermi surface, you deplete the states below, and you can count the, the number of states. The number of particles that are removed are basically a ratio between T and Tf, or if you want this energy divided by the Fermi energy, because this is the Fermi energy. And you provide them an energy which, which is KVT, therefore you get this power of 2 in temperature, and then when you derive, you get a, a linear dependence. Okay, so that's basically the argument. Bene, now uh, let me close uh, this. And uh, now next topic, uh, I would like to... Uh, <laughs> so of course, it, uh, this course is uh, it's the first year that I do it, so it's a little bit uh, uh, somehow experimental in the sense I want to see how to explain some stuff and how people react. So there are, of course, many possible applications of the Fermi linear distribution. Um, probably I've seen many of them in the case of uh, uh, in solid state physics. Uh, so for instance, uh, the properties of metals and, uh, and can, or you can find um, applications in nuclear physics for con what concerns nuclei uh, or um, astrophysics for what concerns the white dwarfs, neutron stars, and so on and so forth. So fermions are everywhere. So the, the applications of Fermi Dirac distribution is, uh, is everywhere. Um, one thing I would like to try to explain, because it's a, it's a nice piece of physics uh, that is, is not usually done, uh, it's a phenomenon uh, which is due to quantum mechanics, uh, and uh, one has to um, well, use the technology that we have de developed, uh, which is the Landau diamagnetism. So, so la domanda è, non l'avete mai fatto questa cosa qui, vero? Il Landau levels e eh, il magnetismo di, eh, diamagnetismo di Landau. Credo, credo di no, però non, non so. Ditemi voi. Mi sembra ci sia stato accennato durante Solid State però non è mai entrato nei dettagli il professore. Ok. So uh, I think it's uh, uh, I, well I don't know if there is a simple way to do it uh, without uh, say the, the, the tools that we have, we have developed. Uh, but actually it's a, it's a nice exercise in which you really uh, need to for instance to take care of uh, the grand canonical partition function and uh, uh, use it in a proper way. So it's a, I think it's a nice application that we, I would like to try to, <laughs> to propose to you uh, instead of doing the white wolf's case, uh, which can, you can do by yourself. Uh, so um, so it's, a, it's a little bit so less involved. This, this calculation is a little bit more involved, but uh, it's interesting. So let me uh, try to do it. 
And so the, the plan is the following, that we do this uh, topic as a application of the Fermi Dirac, as in the case of bosons, we have done the bose einstein condensation. I would like to also propose you an application of the Fermi Dirac in this case. Then we move on to uh, what will be necessarily an introduction to critical phenomena uh, next, uh, the next lecture, okay? Okay, so let me introduce this new topic. Landau Diamagnetism. Okay, so now, for instance, this is a, a case, uh, an example of phenomenon that cannot be explained even at a larger temperature. So in which one would expect actually classical mechanics uh, to, to be the, the, the correct frame actually uh, is not enough. In the sense, even at large temperature, you see effects of uh, quantum mechanics in this context of now the, the magnetism. So this is a, a phenomenon that cannot be explained by using classical mechanics. Well, in general, actually, uh, once you introduce a magnetic field and you want to treat it uh, uh, in the classical, uh, uh, by using the classical partition functions, actually you see that there is there's no effect uh, from the magnetic field in the sense that you cannot explain uh, not the, nor the, the, the magnetism, but not, not even the paramagnetism or the ferromagnetism. And the reason is a, a theorem that we will mention at the end, uh, <coughs> which is the Bohr uh, von Leuven, I think is the pronounced theorem, uh, which states that those kind of effects are, are absent in classical statistical mechanics, but they need uh, quantum mechanics. The reason will be clear uh, in a moment is a quantization of the orbits of uh, electrons, for instance, or charge particles. Okay, so what is, uh, in a few words, what is this phenomenon? So when you have a, a certain material in a, man, in, a, in a magnetic field, you, you learn that there are basically three possibilities. Uh, one of these is a ferromagnetism, the other one is a paramagnetism, and the, and the other one is this one, the magnetism. Ferromagnetism and paramagnetism are corresponding to the fact that when you uh, switch on the magnetic field, uh, you get a finite ma magnetization in your sample which the, with the same sign of the magnetic field okay so if the magnetic field has uh, oriented has been oriented with z positive you get the same orientation in your uh, material uh, whereas for this case it's just the opposite okay the reason is that this phenomenon here is not related to the spin of particles uh, but it is related really to the trajectories that the particles follow in a magnetic field. So basically the idea is the following. Suppose that you have a, a, a here a plane and you have a magnetic field B, which is a constant B uh, in direction Z. Now, if you have a, a charge of particles, uh, let me try to make the, uh, yeah. Okay. If you have a charge of particles with positive charge, for instance, uh, no? and uh, well, basically what you see, suppose that the, the, the motion is in the plane, is that uh, due to the Lorentz force, now I don't know how you normalize the Lorentz force, but okay, you can have a C here depending on are the units that you use, okay? Um, so basically, if the velocity that we see is, for instance, along the y-axis, and this is the magnetic field, then I have a, a charge that is moving, uh, uh, let me see, clockwise, if you see from above, okay? Once this charge is moving clockwise, seen from above, it will generate a big current will generate a magnetic field which is oriented as Z again, but in the, in the other direction. 
And therefore, this kind of phenomenon is actually explaining why in this diamagnetism, uh, the motion of the charges inside a, inside a magnetic field, as due to the Lorentz force, generate a uh, little effect, actually is a little effect, uh, which is uh, uh, to produce a magnetic field that is just the, has the opposite direction with respect to this one. For the paramagnetism or ferromagnetism substances that we will see uh, later on within, within the Ising model, is just the opposite in the sense that in that, in that case, what is important is the intrinsic ma magnetic moment of the particles that will try actually to be oriented as the magnetic field and will enforce the magnetic field. Uh, it will enforce strongly or weakly depending on uh, the fact that you are paramagnetism, uh, that you are in a case of paramagnetism or ferromagnetism. Okay? But the, here is just the opposite. And the reason is a, is a quantization of the levels uh, of the trajectories actually of these charged particles in the magnetic field that are called Landau levels indeed. So let me introduce first the Hamiltonian. And then we see how to compute the, uh, uh, the, the grand canonical partition function and the magnetization. I'm not, I'm not sure we'll finish today, but okay, let me try. Okay, so first of all, let's see how to the, the setup of the calculation. So we have a magnetic field along Z, positive, uh, which is a constant magnetic field. Now, you remember that B can be written as the curve of A, which is the potential vector, and to get a uh, magnetic field along Z constant, you need uh, A to be a uh, minus uh, X, Y, V, X versa. Let me check if this is correct. Yeah, it's correct. You can, uh, uh, you can, uh, mm, uh, you can check whether this is correct by applying the curl uh, to A. Okay? And many y, b, x, versole. Now, the Hamiltonian of a particle under this magnetic field, well, the potential vector, is B divided by, uh, well, now 2m is outside, 1 divided by 2m, and then we have here P minus QA divided by C. QA divided by C, where C is the speed of light. Uh, of course, there is a square here. Now, This formula you have seen before, right? In uh, analytical mechanics or uh, electromagnetism, advanced electromagnetism. Where's the minimal coupling? Uh, so this is the effect of having a potential vector on your part. Okay. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, here we are talking about operators, uh, and uh, actually A must be considered as a classical field, so it's not an operator, but P is an operator. That, of course, has three components, which are the derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. So uh, when I write the Hamiltonian in terms of an operator, is actually, uh, when I think about an operator, it's actually 1 divided by 2n that was outside. Um, then let me do the square the square of this quantity. So I will get, uh, remember that P is uh, H bar uh, uh, divided by I, the gradient, the gradient. So then I have a minus H, minus H squared, uh, the second derivative with respect to X. Second derivative with respect to X. Um, so I'm writing the, the X component, which is the only one which is modified, because consider that A was minus uh, uh, Y B X versa. 
Okay, so the only component of the momentum which is modified is the x component. The other two components are the same. Okay, so let me uh, first write the x component, which is uh, so of, so which will, will be one divided by two m. Then I have the second derivative with respect to x. Then I have uh, let me put down here uh, y squared b squared divided by c squared. So here you have uh, q squared, uh, sorry, q squared, c squared, and then I have uh, y squared, b squared, and uh, uh, then I have the double product, uh, which will be, um, uh, which will be plus because here you have a minus. So when I have a minus here, this becomes a plus. And then I have a Q, Y, B, C, and H bar divided with this letter in the right, uh, C, and then I have H bar derivative with respect to X, and I have I here. Okay. Let me check if I have all the terms. Do a point zero B divisor C, okay. So I'm translating uh, this uh, H into an operative uh, uh, into an operator. Okay, so the, the, the first component will be this operator here. Then I have 1 divided by 2n plus. Uh, then I have, okay, I have the y component, y squared minus h squared. Uh, and the derivative with respect to them. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian contains, uh, but for uh, this second derivative here, contains also first derivative with respect to x that comes from the fact that you have this potential vector. Okay, so now we write the Schrodinger, the stationary Schrodinger equation. So uh, h, what uh, came out of c, same. C is equal to e C, and uh, it's fair, it's uh, reasonable to look for solution of C done in the following way. Um, since you have a dependence here on the Y, that's a sign that the uh, for what concern the Y, uh, the wave function is not just a plane wave, it could be something which is more complicated. And indeed, it's good to uh, look for a solution like this one. Kx, x, which is the x component, or well, the x dependence of the wave function. Then I have i, k, uh, z, z. The z is completely untouched. And then one factorizes the dependence on y by introducing a new function, c. Now, you take this and put in H, C is equal to P, C, where H is this operator that has this term here and all these terms. So, let's try to do it. So when the uh, first part, uh, uh, the one containing the derivative with respect to x, uh, is acting on the wave function that it was before, I get 1 and then I have a kx squared, a squared, which is the standard kinetic, kinetic term. Then I have this constant, uh, which was q squared, y squared, t squared divided by c squared, plus q, 2 q B, C, Y, do a pole epsilon B. Yeah, then here I had a H divided by I, derivative with respect to X that uh, uh, provides a factor of, uh, um, yeah, H, K, X. 
Okay, when doing the derivative h bar kx. Uh, this is acting on uh, c, which is uh, exponential of kx x exponential of k z z and then p of y. Okay, so I'm, I'm just uh, uh, basically introducing the eigenvalues of the operator. Uh, 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 the second derivative with respect to x and first derivative with respect to x. Uh, okay, so then I have uh, similarly, I will have a minus uh, h squared divided by 2m. <coughs> and here I have the operator uh, second derivative of phi with respect to y, which is uh, now the second derivative is acting on, on phi. And we will have a e k x x e k z z, uh, which is factorized, of course, because I'm derived with respect to y. Um, then I have, uh, yeah, we have a minus. Sorry, I think it's on my segno. No, no, okay, I'll just go back. Sorry, I'll just go back. So it's a plus, it's a plus, a squared kz squared divided by 2m, uh, and the same structure, so exponential of ksx, exponential of k z z and phi of y. Now this must be equal to e c. Okay, so the structure has the following uh, uh, shape. You know? So the first operator, uh, when acting on this wave function, uh, gives me a kx, which is to the power of 2 for the kinetic term, and a uh, kx to power of 1 in the case of the first derivative with respect to x. Then I have the standard term, which corresponds to the exact component. And here for the y component, I have an explicit derivative of phi with respect to y. Okay, so now let me remove this exponential, this, this, and of course I will remove from there, and of this, this. And at the end, I get this expression, which is 1 divided by 2m. So let me call this quantity px squared which is the px component of the momentum, plus q squared, y squared, v squared, divided by c squared, plus 2qvcypx, again. This multiplies uh, uh, phi, which is the there, q of y. And then I have the second derivative uh, of y, of oh, sorry, of phi with respect to y, which is this one. And let me put this up there. So I have an e minus, uh, instead of uh, a squared kz squared divided by 2m, I will have a pi, uh, so pz squared divided by 2m. Okay. And that multiplies now the phi of y again. So I have this differential equation uh, in which there appear uh, a function which is this phi of y with the second derivative. And here uh, there's no derivative, but there is a y here, and y squared and y here linear. And here I have an eigenvalues. Okay, so now the trick is basically to write this as a, a sort of uh, uh, harmonic oscillator because you see here that here you have a second derivative with respect to y, whereas here you have a quadratic form in y because here I have y squared and a linear y, and then I have another term. So I can write this as a as a uh, harmonic harmonic potential if you want. Okay, so this is the trick basically. <clears throat> uh, 
Indeed, the, when uh, so one uh, first thing that one can do is to uh, do M of Tolto. Okay, so let's be, let's uh, take care of this for a moment. Let me collect Q squared, V squared divided by C squared. Uh, this will multiply a Y squared, which is in here. Then I have a plus <coughs> uh, P X squared divided by Q squared, D squared divided by C squared. And here I've done anything serious. Plus, uh, so I have a 2ypx, 2ypx divided by qbc. Okay. And now let me call y0 by definition. Uh, B minus C P X divided by Q B. Okay. So when I introduce this Y zero, actually what is written there is uh, uh, okay Q squared B squared divided by C squared, which is still outside. And here I have a Y minus Y Y zero squared. Okay, let me check if this is correct. Okay, of course, I have the y squared, then I have the, the y0 squared, which will be uh, this term here, b squared, c squared, q b squared, and since I have a minus and a minus here, we have the double product, which will be 2 uh, y uh, c divided q. Yeah, okay, it's correct. So, uh, in this way, I can actually write the equation in the following way. <clears throat> so the, the Schrodinger equation now becomes minus h squared divided by 2n, second derivative of p with respect to y. Then I have 1 divided by 2n, which was outside. Uh, I have this QB divided by C squared, which is this term here. Let me now, for just a moment, and I will comment, multiply this by M and divide by M. Then I have a Y minus Y zero uh, squared, and this is applied to P of Y. And then I have here uh, delta E uh, P of Y where delta E is equal to E minus Pz squared divided by 2n. Okay. Vediamo se ho tutto, 1 su 2m, QB, M l'ho messo lì, per un motivo che adesso sarà chiaro, delta e quello là. Now you see this as a structure of a harmonic oscillator. Because you have a second derivative of y, and then you have a quadratic potential, it's just shifted with this y0, but it's a harmonic oscillator. Okay? And uh, now we will write which is the frequency of this harmonic oscillator, which is equal to a certain eigenvalue uh, times p. Indeed, we can introduce uh, omega, omega squared. So let us introduce omega squared by definition to be um, uh, to be this quantity uh, q b c m squared q b m c squared okay <coughs> and uh, now in this way in this way. The equation looks maybe a little bit more familiar uh, because it's this one, respect to y plus uh, 
Um, here you have uh, uh, one half m y um, so sorry omega squared uh, y minus y zero uh, squared, which is applied to phi y, and then I have the delta e y. Okay. Now you see indeed uh, that this is uh, an harmonic oscillator. Okay. Uh, just that it's shifted in the sense that I have uh, that y, so it's not centered in y equals zero, but in y equal to y zero. Okay. So the center is y zero. And what is y0? is better minus before, it was minus c p x divided by uh, what was q b. So actually, the center changes as a function of p x. And since p x has many values, it's, a point, it's quantized, also the y0 will be, uh, will be different. No? So basically, and this is important for the counting, in the sense that uh, Px is a normal uh, uh, spectrum in the box, so it will be 2 pi divided by L. Uh, uh, yeah, n x and h bar <coughs> in order to have the proper dimension. And similarly, Pz has a similar expression, so 2 pi divided by L and Z h bar. Uh, another thing that one can say is that uh, uh, delta E, now these are the eigenvalues of the harmonic oscillator. I think there is a h harmonic, eh? sorry. Uh, and that I uh, being an uh, harmonic oscillator, the eigenvalue of a uh, harmonic oscillator would be something like h bar omega divided by 2, sorry, plus uh, times n plus 1 half. Okay? So I have all the uh, eigenvalues now. So I have the eigenvalues for px and pz, which are the standard ones. And notice that once I change px, I also change y0, which is the center of the harmonic oscillator. And I have the eigenvalues of uh, this harmonic oscillator, which are, the, which are the standard ones. Okay. So basically what we are doing here is somehow to decouple the, the, to, the, the, the trajectory of the particle, which could have, of course, a component in z, Okay, which could be just a translational component provided with this momentum. And okay, we know that the trajectories anyway will be kind of spirals, and we are somehow decomposing these trajectories into the Z component and a component in the plane, but one of them is actually discretized. So this, this is the important thing. I can move the center of all these oscillators on all this circular motion, but they are discretized. So if I look at the x, y plane, so the center is continuous, changes, uh, well, not, not really continuous, but it changes with the px. OK? But I cannot have uh, uh, all the possible values uh, of the energy of those motions, because they are quantized. Okay, so I will have a situation like this. I cannot have a trajectory uh, smaller than a certain value, let's say. Okay, so the, the size, if you want, of the circle, if you want, is determined by the quantization of this energy. Okay. Um, we start it. Now, indeed, uh, what I want to find next uh, in order to compute the partition function is to uh, uh, 
uh, quantify which is the degeneracy which is the degeneracy degeneracy uh, of the motion in the plane okay of the y0 if you want which are the centers of the oscillators oscillators now uh, I have a relation between y0 and p which was y0 is equal to minus c px divided by qb so if I compute the delta, the discretization of y0, which actually will be almost continuous because it's almost continuous px, this will be minus c divided by qb times delta px. Okay. Let me compute the, uh, the modulus of this quantity, which is the interesting part. And now what is delta Px? Delta Px is 2 pi h bar divided by L. Okay, so from here. So this is a, a modulus of uh, minus C Q B. And here I have a 2 pi h bar divided by L of L. H bar divided by L. So let me remove this you know, and define it as a positive quantity. So delta y0, delta y0 is now uh, given by C 2 pi h bar divided by modulus of Q B L. Q is an algebraic quantity, it could be positive and negative, okay, it's the charge of the particle. Uh, now, the question is, how many centers in the plane uh, exploiting the fact that P X is changing well, this will be the size in X, L, so the, the answer to this question is actually L, which is the, the size of the, the range, let's say the range of variability of X and Y, if you want, in the plane. Uh, divided by this delta y0, which is uh, uh, this quantity here, so c2 pi h bar divided by its modulus of q b l. So I conclude that the degeneracy, the degeneracy due to different centers. of the oscillators is a factor which is provided by this relation which is a QBL squared QBL squared uh, divided by 2 pi h bar c 2 pi h bar c okay so let me repeat. The motion is uh, okay. Z is completely decoupled, and the plane. I'm seeing somehow the motion as a sort of harmonic oscillator, which has uh, different possible centers. How many centers I have in this, uh, this kind of motion? Well, this is provided by the the variability of p x. Okay, and the variability of p x turns into different values of delta y zero. 
uh, which allows me to count the number of possible centers that are in my uh, in my plane. Of course, this number could be very large, you know, depending on how large it is L, which is a microscopic quantity. Okay, it could be a very large number, it depends on the system. Okay, now you will see in a moment where does this uh, degeneracy factor come uh, into the game. Because now we have to compute uh, the grand canonical partition function for the system, and we'll see that uh, basically, uh, when looking at the x component of the momentum, we will just have a degeneracy factor. So, so let's write first the grand canonical uh, partition function, which will be. Uh, product over Q of one plus uh, e to the minus beta epsilon Q uh, or if you want mu minus epsilon Q <clears throat> uh, and this is also equal to e to the minus beta omega well omega is the ground potential the ground potential uh, can be written as a a log of the product, which will be a minus kbt, the sum of q. No? Minus kbt, sum of q of the log of 1 plus e beta mu minus epsilon q. Okay, this is in general, okay? Now, let me write this expression for our case, and this is the, the main point. Now, the sum, let's say, splits into different uh, uh, paths, if you want. X component, Y component, though it's not really X and Y component, but okay, let, let's look in this way. Uh, when I do uh, in X, uh, when I consider the X component, the sum will become an integral Uh, on dpx from minus infinity to plus infinity. So here I would have the standard dkz times l divided by 2 pi. And let me write it as dpz. And here let me put, uh, uh, here I have a length. And here 2 pi h bar. Okay. So this is the standard integration of the k, the, the wave number. Instead of the wave number, I'm using just the momentum, which is the same as an h bar difference. Okay. Now instead of z, instead of y or z, I will actually substitute instead of integrating over px and py, I'm actually considering here a degeneracy. The generacy of the oscillators, which will just be a multiplicative factor. So, the fact that you have many oscillators, how many, how many centers, they are provided by this formula here d squared divided by 2 pi h bar c. Whereas here, I will have a sum over the uh, different possible states of the harmonic oscillator. Okay, so we, here we'll have a sum over n of, let's say, e to the beta delta pn uh, z. Okay, so what is written here is the grand canonical partition function in terms of q. This was for a free gas. In this case, it is almost a free gas. There is an external field 
that actually spontaneous in the levels in the, in the sense that it is introducing a discretization of the levels for the harmonic oscillation. Therefore, I can write this uh, uh, grand canonical potential on this, uh, in this form that uh, I will write in a moment and you will see that it's, uh, it's, it's clear. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the omega will be a minus kbt, which is there, of course. Then I have this, this degeneracy factor. This is Q, DL squared divided by 2 pi h bar c, which is the degeneracy. Then I have the integral over Pz, which contributes to that half divided by 2 pi h bar times the integral dpz from minus infinity to plus infinity. Then I have the sum over the levels of the harmonic oscillator. So 0 plus infinity. And finally, I have the log of 1 plus. Here I have each uh, of beta nu. And here I have the energy. Which are the energies? They have a component. So, so here you have e to the beta h or e to the minus sorry e to the minus beta times the eigenvalues of so the Hamiltonian, which are these eigenvalues. Well, there is the z component of the momentum, which is a minus pz divided by two pz squared divided by two m, on which I'm integrating over. And then there are the levels. Sorry, here yeah, I'm doing the mess. It is outside, of course. And then I have the levels of the harmonic oscillator. So we have h bar omega uh, n plus 1 out. And that's it. Okay. Now this is equal to minus k dt, minus k dt. Um, equal. Here you have L cube L, which is a volume, and therefore this is actually omega divided by the volume, which is a minus the pressure actually. So you have a minus k dt, then I have a qb cube. B divided by uh, what is that? There are four pi squared h bar squared c. Then we have a z graph from minus infinity to plus infinity over e to z sum and zero to plus infinity of the log of one plus e beta mu minus p z squared divided by 2n minus h omega n plus 1 out. Okay, now this formula is a, is a correct result. There are no approximation here. Here everything is analytic up to this point. And in principle I can compute all the thermodynamical quantities that I want. For instance, the pressure will be minus omega divided by the volume, okay? And if I want to compute the number of density, uh, so number of particles uh, to, to, to find the relation between the number of particles in the fugacity, I should, uh, I should apply the, the, the usual formula, which is uh, uh, the following, okay? So now everything for the thermodynamics is uh, fixed, okay? So here I derive the thermodynamics. And I can do uh, for every values of temperature and so on and so forth. Okay, I just need to use this two equation, which is of course a numerical task at this level. Now, what we will do actually is not to compute the thermodynamics to which we are not so much interested. We want to compute something different, which is the magnetization of our sample, 
and the susceptibility, which means the response of the magnetization to a, a modification of the magnetic field. And at some point, you will see in a moment that the magnetization is also derived from the grand canonical partition function by just doing derivatives as usual. But before coming to that, I need, uh, I need a small uh, empirical uh, way to define what is the magnetization. So, the equation of state was derived before, and I will not take care of this anymore. Okay? What I want to do is to find the magnetization. Because at the end, I don't want to explain which is, which is the effect of the diamagnetism. Okay, so to do that, uh, let us introduce uh, in a, an empirical way, I said. It's, it's a trick, basically. So, Intuitively, what is the magnetization? Is basically, uh, if you think about uh, some, some magnets, uh, small microscopic magnets, uh, basically the magnetization is uh, um, proportional, let me call M, is proportional to the number of magnets having the same direction of the external magnetic field minus the number of magnets having the opposite magnetization with respect to uh, magnetic field. So let's say this is a parallel to B, and this is anti parallel. In a similar fashion that we had uh, in the case of this, uh, uh, the beginning. Uh, in which we had the spin, uh, the system of discretized spins. Now there were the spin up and spin down. The, the, the net magnetization basically is just the number of the one pointing in the same direction in the magnetic field, and the number of, 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 of magnets, microscopic magnets, pointing down opposite to the, to the magnetic field. Okay? Now, to define this uh, uh, in, a, in a empirical, so, so this is correct, okay? Now, I can show you that this quantity is actually can be obtained as a derivative with respect to the magnetic field of the grand canonical partition function. Of course, our canonical, grand canonical partition function, the sum that we derived before, the log of level g, it is a function of the magnetic field, because the magnetic field was uh, inside the degeneracy, but it was also inside the omega, which was the, uh, the frequency of the harmonic oscillators. So, so it depends, of course, on the magnetic field. Okay? Uh, now, let me try to do it in a, in a empirical way, as I said before, and to try to convince you that uh, this is the current definition of the magnetization. Uh, so the trick is the following, basically. So the log of z of g is the uh, is the, uh, the sum of a q of the log of one plus e theta mu minus epsilon q. Now let me make a derivative with respect to epsilon q of the log of z of g. If I do this derivative, I get 1 plus e theta nu minus epsilon q. And here I should have the exponential nu minus epsilon q times minus beta. Which is equal to let me multiply by e to the minus beta mu minus epsilon q. Therefore, I will have a minus beta 1 divided by e to the beta epsilon q minus mu plus 1. Therefore, 
I get that uh, uh, minus uh, kdt, the derivative with respect to epsilon q of the log of the grand canonical partition function is 1 divided by e beta epsilon q minus mu plus 1, which is nothing but the occupation number and q. Okay? So I have this nice formula that tells me that the occupation number can be derived from the grand canonical partition function by doing the, this derivative. Okay? Now, suppose that we have uh, some microscopic magnets with the magnetic, with the, uh, mag uh, magnetic moment. Suppose that we have some microscopic magnets with magnetic moment level alpha. When they couple V, the magnetic field, I will have a contribution to the energy of those microscopic magnets, which is equal to minus alpha V plus, okay, other terms, or epsilon Q is equal to alpha V plus other terms, in the case in which they are aligned or parallel to V, or anti-parallel B, which means that when they have the same direction of B, uh, you have a minimization of the energy, of course. Whereas the opposite is so you pay price when they are anti-parallel to B. Now, you see here that there is a relation, a linear relation between epsilon 2 and B. Therefore, if I derive with respect to epsilon q, is like deriving with respect to b. Okay. Actually, with a minus for aligned and with a plus for anti-parallel. Let me write it down. Uh, you get a plus, uh, so you get a minus with a minus for parallel and a plus for anti parallel. Okay, so therefore. When I do, when I say that NQ is equal to minus KDT derivative with respect to epsilon Q of the log of Z of G, I can actually reshuffle, if you want this, and write that the N plus, so the number of particles which will have the same orientation as the external magnetic field, will be a KDT derivative with respect to B of the log of Z of G. Because this minus uh, uh, takes this minus and then it becomes plus. Okay. Um, so, so somehow when doing this derivative with respect to B, uh, we get that all of the, all of the terms uh, parallel to B will contribute uh, uh, sorry, this is the net number. We contribute uh, with a different sign. So, if you have uh, the, 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 the parallel, you get a minus there, but with a minus here, you get a plus. So, you, you will have the number of particles with a plus, so parallel to the magnetic field. 
If you take the particles having uh, the opposite, so having the uh, magnetic moment uh, in the pointing in the, the opposite direction, you have a plus, and then the minus there becomes a minus. Therefore, this derivative actually provides you the net number uh, in terms of, of magnetization. I don't know if this is clear. It's, it's, it is an experiment. È chiaro quello che ho detto? Più o meno? Ve lo posso dire in italiano? Non, non so se cambia qualcosa. Okay. Otteniamo il numero netto. Il numero netto lo ottieni perché quando tu derivi rispetto a B c'è una differenza, qui ti becchi in meno e qui ti becchi in più. Ok. Allora, facciamo un esempio. Supponiamo che nella partition function tu hai dei termini, uh, supponiamo di avere 1 fatto così, 1 più e alla beta, togliamoci il potenziale, il potenziale chimico per, per semplicità. Supponiamo di avere meno, uh, allora qui c'hai alfa b, prendiamocelo con il segno meno, che con il meno che se qui diventa più. Uh, poi avrai un logaritmo di 1 più e alla meno beta alfa beta alfa b scusa che questo è b non è che b questo qui è allineato questo è disallineato questo è chiaro no? perché in un caso c'hai un meno alfa beta che col meno che c'è nella, nella non esponenziale diventa più e qui hai un meno perché avevi un più è chiaro? sì sì, fin qua sì adesso se derivi rispetto a B prendi queste derivi rispetto a B e qui cosa ottieni? ottieni 1 diviso 1 più E alla beta alfa B poi vabbè ci avrai E alla beta alfa B per alfa e quindi becchi un segno meno no? perché avresti sempre un 1 più l'esponenziale però derivando rispetto a b ottieni sempre l'esponenziale e ottieni un meno beta uh, b cioè lui ti distingue il segno che c'è tra il momento magnetico e il campo magnetico chiaro? Okay. ok, questo qui rappresenta l'occupation number di quelli, di, questo qui diciamo rappresenta l'occupation number di quelli paralleli, se vuoi, e questo è l'occupation number di quelli antiparalleli. E questo segno meno ti aggiusta il net number, questo l'ho messo fuori, questo segno meno. Ok? Cioè quando tu derivi rispetto a epsilon q non fai nessuna differenza, se c'hai particelle libere tu hai log di 1 più e alla a meno beta epsilon q, vabbè, quando derivi non hai nessuna distinzione, però se la epsilon q contiene un termine che è meno alfa b o più alfa b, a seconda che sia allineato o disallineato, e derivi rispetto a b, in un caso avrai un segno, in un altro caso avrai l'opposto. Poi devi stare attento che ci siano i segni giusti, però è chiaro che sarà uno l'opposto dell'altro. Ok? Perché derivare rispetto a epsilon q è come derivare rispetto a b, però in, nei due casi b ha due segni opposti, questo coefficiente ha due segni opposti. È chiaro? Okay. Sì, okay. dovrebbe essere più chiaro. Magari la, la prossima volta ve lo, ve lo rispiego, comunque è un, è un, è un trick. È sì, un trick. Sì. Dal punto di vista matematico era chiaro, però non capivo perché comprese sia n più che n meno, okay. quando all'inizio solamente che il numero di occupazione, cioè non c'era una sommatoria apparentemente. Allora qui tu devi sommare su tutti i possibili stati, no? Ci saranno quelli che sono allineati, quelli che sono disallineati e in quella sommatoria compaiono tutti, tutti i livelli energetici, ok? okay. E quindi tu c'hai una, una somma di un sacco di termini, alcuni saranno allineati, altri saranno disallineati, fai le derivate, quelli che sono allineati si beccano un segno, quelli che sono disallineati se ne beccano un altro, 
il feedback è un segno opposto. E quindi è come contare il net number. Ok? okay. E in effetti questo è un trucchetto uh, per definire quella che è la uh, in the final chip the magnetization. Is actually defined to be KBT, uh, and then you have the derivative with respect to the magnetic field of the log of the grand canonical partition function. One can define it uh, to be the, the, this quantity here, but to provide an explanation for that, uh, I, uh, I use this trick. Okay? Basically, this is the definition of the magnetization. Okay? And the reason for that is the, the little argument that I was presenting you that uh, I hope is not actually uh, confusing you even more. Okay? But this is uh, uh, basically the definition of the magnetization. When computing this derivative with respect to B, not with respect to beta, here we, have, we are in the grand canonical ensemble and we need to fix T mu and volume, those are fixed. The other quantity which is to interest for us, for interesting for us, is the susceptibility, which is indicated by this uh, quantity. And this quantity is the derivative of the magnetization with respect to uh, B. So if you want, it's a second derivative of, uh, of the log of Z of G. Again, this is the fixed T, mu, and volume. This, this is called isothermal, isothermal sushet T, B, B, B. Isothermal susceptibility. Okay? What we will see is that this particular, this isothermal susceptibility will be negative. Okay, this is the diamagnetism. The when you increase the magnetic field, then you see that the magnetization in some direction, the magnetization goes just to the opposite. Okay. okay, so I think I still have some uh, 10 minutes, so we can go on. Now we will see, we will start to introduce some simplifying assumption, and we are forced to do that in order to make some calculations, otherwise would be numerical. So let's do the limit of high temperature. Well, maybe, maybe T infinity, maybe it's too much, but let's say high temperature. Limit of uh, high temperature, which actually is better to say High temperature is a classical limit in which Z, the fugacity, is going to zero. Uh, there are also some nice properties uh, when you go to the quantum limit uh, that I will not discuss because it will take too much time. But let's try to finish at least the case of uh, the classical limit, which will have some. Uh, uh, in which, uh, in any case, uh, the effect of quantization of the uh, of the trajectory is uh, still present. It actually provides an explanation for this effect. Okay. Now, when you do uh, the classical limit, classical limit, uh, well, the log of one plus. Uh, um, e to the mu mu b epsilon q. I think that this is we said already, but uh, <clears throat> this basically becomes uh, um, the exponential of beta mu minus epsilon q in general, no? Because uh, this quantity is zero, and you can expand the log of one plus x to uh, you can assume that it's almost equal to x, which is the exponential. That sim it simplifies a lot our calculation because now the logarithm of the grand canonical partition function uh, has uh, the following form. Okay, there are some factors which are still there. 
q v volume divided by 4 pi squared h bar squared c and I think it's everything there then I have the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of the dt set uh, uh, and then I have the sum from zero to plus infinity uh, exponential beta mu which is I better put outside at some point uh, then I have the exponential of minus beta pz squared divided by 2m and finally the exponential of minus beta minus beta h bar omega and plus one half and I think I have everything there see okay uh, so you see that uh, uh, so here the integrals refers to the pz component of the momentum the sum refers to the sum of the energy levels of the harmonic oscillators and here this is the, the generacy factor that comes from the fact that I can move the centers of this oscillation, these oscillators in the plane by following the rules that I derived before. Now, okay, I can do uh, first uh, uh, this integral over pz, which is the standard one. So I have a q v v divided by four pi squared h bar squared c. Uh, then I have an exponential beta mu, which is this term here. And let me do the integral over pz that will provide a square root of two m uh, pi uh, kvt. Okay. And then I have the sum. Uh, okay, let me do let me do a little uh, um, modification of this. Okay, I write first the result. Let me call e to the minus x and uh, here we have the sum from zero to plus infinity of uh, exponential of uh, uh, what was there uh, exponential of uh, minus uh, one divided by kvt and uh, here what they have we have an h bar omega and n I'll, I'll tell you in a moment which this x just a, just a moment so remember first that the omega this was the frequency was a q b divided by m c and let me call x the variable q uh, b h bar divided by 2 mc kvt so in this way the one half that I, want, I have there so I have the some point of minus h omega divided by 2 is just uh, uh, x so let me check if this is correct that part, that's why I put e to the minus x there. Uh, just, uh, so I have uh, uh, omega, we will find questo diviso factor bt and uh, diviso 2. Okay. And this is the multiplicator of the bar. See, okay, just. And uh, uh, so I have this e to the minus x. Here I'm left then with 1 divided by kvt, so it's a bit of a ground, kvt, uh, h bar omega times n, which is actually the sum from 0 to plus infinity of e to the minus 2x to the power of n. <clears throat> 
by substituting again this omega, which is QBMC. Okay, lo moltiplico quello uh, per 2, ottengo QBH diviso MCKBT. Bene, now at this point, so the log of 0 g is equal to QB to minus B uh, B divided by 4 pi squared H bar squared C then I have the 2M pi KBT and then I have the exponential of E beta mu then I have E to the minus X and when I do the sum of these I get 1 minus uh, 1 divided by 1 minus exponential of minus 2x. Okay, so 1 minus 2x. Uh, that comes from this sum here. It's a geometrical uh, series. Okay, almost done. Almost done. Uh, let me uh, write this uh, in a little bit different way. So you have the exponential minus x, 1 minus exponential minus 2x. Uh, let me multiply by e uh, to the x, so e x minus e minus x. Uh, this will be 1 divided by 2, the sinus, hyperbolic sine of x. Uh, which is equal to 1 divided by 2. Now, x contains uh, uh, a ratio uh, between this quantity here, q, b, h, 2, b, m, c, d, b, and t. Okay? So, in our limit, x is a small number because we are in the large temperature limit. which is the only way to do the calculation. Uh, so I can expand this quantity around the x equals 0, and I will get x, x cubed divided by 3 factorial plus some terms, uh, <coughs> which is 1 divided by 2x, and here you have 1 plus x squared divided by 6 plus other terms. Uh, which is equal to 1 divided by 2x and here I put uh, upstairs is 1 minus x squared 6 1 minus x squared divided by 6 plus our terms ok so basically, I can write uh, this ratio e to the minus s, x divided by 1 minus exponential minus 2x as 1 divided by 2x, 1 minus x squared divided by 6. Okay? So let me just write the final expression and I'll stop here and I will continue, continue next time. But uh, we, are all, we are almost finished actually. So now, by introducing this, uh, I, I have the log of Z of G. Okay, it contains all these three factors. We have a Q, B, B, divided by 4 pi squared H squared C. Uh, then there is the square root of 2 pi M K T, exponential of beta mu. Now we have uh, to introduce this 1 divided by 2x, so 1 divided by 2x, x was q b h bar divided by 2m c k b t. And here you have 1 minus x squared, 1 sixth, sorry, 1 sixth of x squared, uh, which is uh, again 
Vediamolo qua. It's a Q squared D squared H bar squared divided by uh, 2MC KDT squared. Direi che c'è tutto. Ok, so now we can do some, uh, we can simplify something apart from this correction here, uh, which is the important one actually, is the, all this uh, is done basically to obtain this correction. Uh, I just want to check whether the terms that are there, the concepts, should be the case. Let me check it. So, C and C, you can remove it. QB and QB, you can also remove it. Um, then I have a 2 and a 2 that I can also remove. Now, if I have done the, cur the calculations correctly, okay, let me check. Um, dunque. What is left there? So M is correct, then I have uh, uh, 4 pi squared. Uh, dunque, KBT and 2 M pi. So, okay, let me write first this. Beta mu is there. Then I have a volume. And then I should have, but let, me, let me check, so I should have correct this. 2 M. 2 pi m k dt to the power of 3 r divided by h squared, where h is h and not h bar. It should be fine in the sense that this is an h bar squared and this is an h bar, um, so, so therefore I have a, a h uh, squared, and uh, this should be correct. So all the factors should be correct. Okay, I will check it, I will check it, but you, you can check by yourself and, and see if you find some errors, but it should be correct. Uh, so I have a 2 pi and kbt divided by h squared, 3 half, yeah, and then I have a 1 minus uh, 1 6 of this quantity here, which is as q h bar divided by 2 mc squared, times b divided by kbt squared. And I stop here. I just want to comment on the fact that now this quantity basically, if I neglect the dependence on b, so if I put b equals zero, this quantity should just be n, so the number of particles, which is the log of z of g, is n in the case of ideal gas, okay? Let me just check this if this is correct, and then but this should be the case because I have the e to the beta mu, e to the beta mu times the volume, and this quantity is just uh, um, one divided by lambda cubed. Okay, now mu is equal to um, mu is equal to kdt log of ok, facciamo la prossima volta che sono già 33 scusate. comunque, so this should be just the number of particles and then I have a correction in the magnetic field notice that here I have a minus eh? and this minus is basically the, the magnetic effect but it's better that we continue the next time because it's already over scusate se ho sforato un po' Eh, ma voi, voi siete delle vittime di un esperimento, tra l'altro anche sotto, sotto epidemia. Ci vediamo giovedì prossimo. Arrivederci. 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 Arrivederci.